Have you ever wondered how you can make your own CPU or microcontroller? Have you ever been curious about field programmable gate arrays, also known as FPGAs, but find them to be mysterious black boxes? Or wished you had a microcontroller-like device with a larger memory address or a wider data bus? Well, stay tuned as we delve into the world of FPGAs and create a CPU and eventual microcontroller from scratch. Hello, and welcome to 100 Random Tasks. I'm your host, Philip Lett, and if you like what you see here, please give us a like and leave a comment, and subscribe if you want to be notified when more videos are uploaded. YouTube is new for me, and I'll do my best to add new content as often as I can. In part one, I will be going over the outline of the first basic CPU, and then create a Hello World program consisting of the simplest of 4-bit counters, using Verilog and running it on my Spartan breakout board here, a device of my own making using the Spartan 3A chip from Xilinx. If you are interested in this board, leave a comment and with enough interest, I'll make this available to pick up on my website 100randomtasks.com. And if you want to check us out, I'll leave the link in the description below. But you can use pretty much any board with the Spartan 3A chip. So let's get started. All right, here's the outline of the CPU containing the essential parts. At the heart of all CPUs is the ALU and accumulator. Without them, it's impossible to manipulate any of the data within our system. Below this is the instruction register and a control block. These work together to coordinate all the actions inside the CPU and manage the control lines like select, IR load, DR load, and so forth. Next is a data register, general purpose for holding temporary data. Below that is the program counter, which holds the address of the next byte of the program to be read from memory. And lastly is the address register, which holds the address of the current read or write from memory outside the CPU. As I create the various blocks, I will describe their operation in more detail. Now this CPU only has an address bus of 8 bits, giving a small 256 bytes of memory. But this will suffice for this early design. In later videos, I'll expand this to something more useful. As a side note, the basis for this video series is coming from a great PDF on CPU design with an excellent overview of design principles. Check the description for a link to this PDF if you're interested. Now we'll look at the coding to make this ultra-simple 4-bit counter on the Xilinx ISE program. Here we are in the ISE design suite where the magic happens, and I've started a new project based on the Spartan 3A using a schematic file as the top level and added a schematic to the project. This short demo will use a Verilog file and create the 4-bit counter. To start, I need to add a new Verilog source to the project and define the inputs and the outputs. For the input, we simply need a clock, the output, Q, it's going to be 4 bits, so our most significant bit needs to be 3. The software then defines a template for us. First we have to add reg to our output so that it will latch our data as it changes. And then we'll start it with an initial block. And what this will do for us is set the initial conditions of power up. So because it's a 4-bit counter, we can have a value anywhere between 0 and 15. The next part will be an always block. What this says is that always at the positive edge of the clock, we will do whatever is between the begin and the end statements. So in this case, we are simply going to increment our output by 1. With our basic 4-bit counter now coded, we can go ahead and we will check the syntax of our code. The final thing we need to do now that our code is completed and our syntax is correct is create a schematic block. What this will do for us is give us a visual representation that we can add to our schematic. So we go to our schematic, check our symbols, 
and in here we have our counter. And we'll place that here. And if we zoom in, we can see our counter has our input for a clock and our output queue. So we'll go ahead and create our inputs and our outputs, which then go from our chip. And we'll give these names that we can understand. So our input will simply be clock. And we have our bus queue. At this point, we could go ahead and implement this design and it would work quite fine. But the pinouts could shift around between implementations from one to another. So the next thing that we'd like to do is create a user constraints file. We'll simply create a new source, implement implementation constraints file, and we'll call this pins. And we'll set our definitions for our pins. With that finished, we can then go ahead and implement our top design. With our implementation completed successfully, we can now generate the programming file. With the program generated, I can send it to the Spartan. So I'll just connect my JTAG programmer here. And by the way, this is a parallel programmer that is available on my website as a kit. I know parallel ports are pretty rare these days, but if you have one and would like to pick one of these up, I'll leave a link in the description below. With the programmer now connected, I can initialize and configure the impact software. First, I'll initialize the chain. It should say identify succeeded and display two items, the Spartan chip on the left and the JTAG prom on the right. The Spartan itself doesn't store the program permanently and will lose the program if reset or the power is toggled. If you want the Spartan to run independently, it needs an external prom. There are a few ways to do this, but the board on here I have has a one megabit prom memory, which the Spartan can load from after a reset or at power up. I'll go ahead and assign the configuration file to the Spartan. Since there is no SPI or BPI prom, I'll skip the next step and then bypass the file for the prom for now. In a later video, I'll show you how to program this prom to make the Spartan self-running. I'll leave the default settings next and hit OK. At this point, I am ready to program the chip. I'll right-click the icon and select Program. You should see program succeeded on screen, and if all is well, I should be able to press the monostable clock button here, and the clock should count. And there it is. You'll notice that the clock only increments when the red LED light turns on, just like as was specified in the Verilog file to only increment on the positive edge of the clock. We can see the counter in action if I switch to A-stable mode. You'll also notice that I already have the LEDs on the clock line connected. This is why I created the user constraints file and specified the pinouts. If I hadn't done this, then the implementer could place the IO pins anywhere and could change them between builds. This prevents having to potentially rewire the secret circuit between each build. This isn't a big problem when it's just a couple of LEDs, 
but when you have 8 data lines, 16 address lines, and control lines, it becomes a headache. So that's it for part 1. In the next video, I'll begin to create the registers for the CPU and test their operation. And if you've made it this far in the video, thanks for watching, and subscribe to see future videos. As I said at the beginning, YouTube is new to me, and I'm working to find my groove. So if you have any constructive criticism on how I can make these videos better or more informative, please feel free to leave a like and a comment below. See you next time.